Acts chapter 15, if you will, to get the uh, entire picture. We're going to start reading with verse 4, but our subject, <coughs> Lord willing, is in verse 19. Trouble them not, or rather, trouble not them. Acts 15, we'll begin reading with verse 4. Our subject, verse 19, trouble not them. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church. In verse 3, they were sent out by the church in Antioch, and they being Paul and Barnabas, and we know according to the book of Galatians, also Titus was with them. Titus's name is not mentioned in the book of Acts. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. Everywhere Paul and Barnabas go, they begin to relate what God has done, and it always calls worship. And there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed, saying that it is needful to circumcise them, comma, and to command them to keep the law of Moses. You see in verse number 1, they said, all, all we want you to do is be circumcised. Now, as it goes on, you look down in verse number three, excuse me, verse number, what was that, five, and you say, he says, well, we want you to keep the whole law. Look at Galatians 5, 3, just real quick. No, no, I don't want you to miss this. These experiences of, of the Apostle Paul came into the writings of the Apostle Paul and he writes to the Galatian Christians in chapter 5 and verse number 3 and says this. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is debtor to do what? You can't take a piece of it. You got to either get to heaven by being perfect or you got to get there by the grace of, the, of God applying Jesus Christ's perfection to you. But you see, he, he makes it into uh, part of the scriptures. The Holy Ghost does. Uh, For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, or being circumcised, that he is a debtor to do the whole law. If you start out on that road, you've got to do the whole thing. And it's, it's, it's amazing how in verse 1 of chapter 15, these guys said, we just want you to be circumcised, we'll be happy. Now get up to Jerusalem where James and the boys were. Look at chapter 21 and verse 20 of Acts. <clears throat> I'm taking a long runway to get it airborne today. Acts 21 20, but it's because I love you and I want you to know what's going on. Amen. This is Paul talking to James at Jerusalem. You'll see that in verse number 17 and 18 of Acts 21. Then in verse 20, uh, James tells Paul, And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and finish it out for me, would you? And they are all zealous of the law. So centered around James was a nucleus of possibly believing Christians. I'm sure they were believing Christians, but they had not let go of having to keep the law as well. So this is the influence that comes in, and it reminds me of a beautiful stream, uh, clear as crystal. You can see the fish. You can see all the way to the bottom, and it goes into this beautiful lake, and then somebody builds a factory, and they dump all their toxic waste in there, and you can see all the toxic and sludge and all of that black gooey junk coming in to that beautiful stream. That's what you have in verses 1 and 5 of Acts chapter 15. Got this beautiful grace of God. Everybody's thrilled to death, praising God when they rehearse what God has done among them, saving Gentiles, people that's uncircumcised, didn't have to learn the law, just had to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, it's amazing to me what Peter says uh, in verse number 11. I'm going to skip ahead and I'm going to preach a little bit. Is that all right, brother? <laughs> Uh, Acts chapter 15 verse 11 P Peter finishes out his sermon to these guys in Jerusalem by saying this and it is very noteworthy Acts 15 11 but we believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved 
even as they. Now you say, what's amazing about that? He didn't say like these Judaizers were saying, y'all got to be saved just like us. He turns it around. And Peter says, if any of us Jews are saved, we're going to have to be saved just like them Gentiles got saved. Amen. <laughs> That's good. Isn't that good? Yeah. Man, I like it. I couldn't hardly wait to get that to you. <laughs> Amen. All right. Here, let's, where was we? All right. Verse number 6 of Acts 15. <clears throat> and the apostles and elders. Now, James was an elder. He was not an apostle. James 1, uh, let's see. No, it's Galatians 1.19. He's the brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jude, in Jude 1.1, 1, 1, says that he was the brother of James. So the, these are the, he's the brother of Christ, the half-brother. And uh, he's the pastor, as far as I can see, the elder of the church in Jerusalem. So they have the apostles there and the elders came together for to consider this matter. And when they had been much disputing, Peter rose up just like he did on Pentecost, and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know how that, and this is very noteworthy, that a good while ago, he said, I'm tired of this. This thing's already been handled. A good while ago, God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my very mouth should hear the word of the gospel. Last two words. He just stands up and says, Now, wait a minute. It's not like y'all don't know. Look back at chapter 11 of Acts. It's not like y'all don't know. Look at Acts chapter 11, verse 1. And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the... Circus. Here we go again. It didn't say they did, that they rejected the law of Moses in verse 1. It said they received the word of God. Is anything wrong with that? I don't think so. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him, saying, Thou wentest in to men uncircumcised and did, with, did eat with them. They don't care that they got saved. Right. They said, You defiled yourself. And then verse 4. This is what makes Peter so upset over here in chapter 15. But Peter, rehearsing the matter from the beginning, and expounded it by order unto them, saying, and he gives them the whole enchilada of everything that God had done to him down in Joppa, and how he went to Cornelius' house. Look at verse 16. Acts eleven sixteen. 16. Then remembered I, so you, do, you need to remember too, then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them the like gift. Do you think I have the opportunity or the ability to be able to give anybody the Holy Ghost? If they got the Holy Ghost, they got him the same way we did on Pentecost, and it was by God. Peter said, quit talking to me about circumcision, uncircumcision, who I eat with, who I don't with. Come on up higher. Rise up, ye men of God. Have done with lesser things. Get on up here on the spiritual plane. Mount up with wings as eagles. Quit hopping on the ground like robins looking for a worm. Quit down there picking on stuff that's earthy. Get up here in the heavenlies and see that, that God gave them the light gift as he did unto us. So this particular uh, mindset of Peter pops back up in here in chapter 15. And by the way, chapter 15 is the last time you'll ever see Peter's name in the book of Acts. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand? What was the response to this? Verse 18, when they heard these things, who? The men of Judea, those who were of the circumcision, right? Okay. And when they heard these things, they shut up. God said, I'm going to say my word and all the, all the world can become guilty before God and every mouth will be stopped. Just so you throw down your shotgun of rebellion and wave a white flag of surrender if God ever hits you in the heart with the word of God. 
you ain't got nothing else to say, but God have mercy on me, a sinner. Listen. And when they heard these things, they held their peace and did what? Glorified God, saying, and here is their verbal testimony. Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted circumcision unto no. They got it right. God has granted repentance unto life. They got it. They had it. They keep going back. This thing is so powerful, even Peter is going to go back. Barnabas is going to fall away. For a while, guess who stands in their face and gets them straightened out? The Apostle Paul. So we see Peter rose up and he says in verse 7 of Acts 15, Men and brethren, ye know, and you ought to cross-reference chapter 11 to that, ye know how that a good while ago uh, God made choice among us uh, that, uh, that he would, you know, call me out, that I would uh, be the one speaking. He'd use my, my big mouth, that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Now listen. And the heart knowing God, that's how the inner linear reads it, and God which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness. Did you know that when you die, whether it's with the undertaker getting your physical body or else you're standing here when God comes back and he quickens you into a, an, into a glorified body like unto his, do you realize that you know who's going to give your testimony for you? God is. Jesus Christ is going to show his nail print hands, his nail scarred feet, and look at his father and said, they are mine. You know, what they, you know what the book calls him? An advocate. You know what that is? That's your lawyer. And that's, this is the one that wrote the law. God's going to bear witness of you. Isn't that good? The Holy, you know what? You ain't got to wait till you get there for God to bear witness of you. The Holy Ghost already doing it. Are you living for Jesus? You ain't doing it by the flesh. Is, is your Christian life acceptable to God, your, which is your reasonable service? Then you ain't doing it by the flesh. You ain't doing it by legalistic Baptist faith. You're doing it by the indwelling of the Holy Ghost of God. Amen. Ain't that good? Yes. Woo, I'd make a Presbyterian shout. Listen. And God which knoweth the heart, bear them witness. What was the witness of God that he gave to them? giving them the Holy Ghost, watch it now, even in the like manner as he did unto us. It's the same thing. You condemn them, you have to condemn yourself because they got it from God just like we did and they got the evidence of, uh, of, of the Holy Ghost just like we did. Listen, and this sounds like Paul's writing in the book of Romans. Uh, Romans 3, 23, and in, 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 in verse 9 of chapter 15 of Acts, and put no difference between us and them purifying their hearts. How? By faith. By faith. Listen, put no difference is tearing down the middle wall of partition. Amen. Amen. Uh, 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 I know the book in a minute. Uh, starts with the E. Ephesians. 2, 14, and 15. God said, I'm tearing down the wall. You know, the heavenly house in Ephesians chapter 2 groweth. That's the church. The, the, the spiritual organism groweth for a holy habitation for God. God's so big, the heaven of heavens can't contain him, but the church is going to contain him. But it has to keep on growing because they keep finding out more about God. But if you're going to grow your house, you know, one of the things you have to do, tear down some walls. You say, well, this ain't no load-bearing wall, and we want to open this up. So you tear down a wall. Jesus said, I got a house, the church, and it groweth, so I got to tear down a wall. What wall are you going to tear down? The middle wall of petition between the Jews and Gentiles. How are you going to do that? I'm going to nail it to the cross. That's the Bible. I ain't got time to go find all them verses, but that's the Bible. Listen. 
and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, watch it now, why try or tempt ye God? Ooh. Folks, you mess around with legalistic religion, you're tempting God. You know why it's a temptation to God? Because God so loved, He gave His only begotten Son so that whosoever could would believe in Him, plus or minus nothing, should have everlasting life. And if you look at God and say, yeah, Jesus did all right, but we better keep the law to make sure we're going to really get saved. God said, mm, you're tempting God, soul. The majority of fundamental religion in America is pure legalism. That's the truth. What they do and what they don't do proves whether they are accepted with God or not. Dear soul, what you do or don't do is evidence of whether grace is in your heart or not. I don't do in order to be saved. I'm doing because I am saved. Right, right. Amen, brother. Listen. Why now, therefore, why tempt ye God? And listen how closely related the, uh, the believers uh, who are the recipients of grace are coupled with God. If you do this, number one, you tempt God. And number two, you do it, you tempt God by putting a yoke upon the neck of the disciples. Dear soul, you be careful. Let no man take your liberty from you, which you have in Christ. You watch out for priestcraft. You watch out for people who try to bind your conscience. Jesus Christ gave you liberty, life. He, gave, he, he, he brought you into the, into the eternal life of God. They shall come in and out. That's liberty. And find, and find peace to their souls. And, and you don't owe anybody anything except Christ. And those who require something more than Christ, get away from them. Amen. Listen. The majority of fundamental religion is nothing but pure legalism. And it's led by two things. Guilt and pity. You can go into a church, show your slides, and show pot-bellied uh, little kids of young in Africa with flies on their nose and make everybody feel guilty and get up a big offering. You go in there and preach the Word of God, see how much you get by preaching the Word of God and, and, try, and, and waiting on the Holy Ghost. You find out who's in this thing and who ain't. People are ruled by guilt and pity. Inordinate affections is, 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 is the prime usage of, of Satan, the angel of light, and people think of weeping and feeling some tingling on their spine and hair standing on their neck is the Holy Ghost, and it ain't. You can go see a scary movie and get that. My soul. We need to get back to God. Yeah. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God? What tempts God? Putting a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers, nor by the way, you guys, sitting here today, are able to bear. Brought it home to them, didn't he? Yeah. But we believe, that is, I, Peter, personally believe as an apostle of Jesus Christ, that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we Jews shall be saved even as they the Gentiles. And I like the way he said it. He said, law plus or minus nothing. It's grace alone that saves the Jew. It's grace alone that saves the Gentile. Now, I had a hard time about this business of the law. One preacher would get up and say, uh, we shouldn't be bound by the law that it, it, it will destroy justification by faith. And I said, Amen. Another preacher get up and he said, The law is just and holy and good, and it's right to be and it's right to be lawful because God is God of law. And I said, Amen. And then the devil said, Put them two together. I said, mm. We're not we're not talking about 
uh, the law that expresses the character of God, it's always wrong not to kill, not to steal, not to commit adultery, not to, not to covet. All of that never ever changes because God is holy and He doesn't change. But the ceremonial law that the Jews had to keep, touch not, taste not, feel not, all that stuff, Paul said it was to disappear and dissolve with the usage. It was used. It was used. It's gone now. What do they call it now? Weak and beggarly elements. For what the law could not do. What was wrong with the law? Nothing's wrong with the law. The second phrase will tell you. This is Romans 8, 3 if you want to look at it. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. We couldn't keep the law. Why? We were in Adam and not in Christ. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son. That's why this makes God mad. That's why this tempts God. God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemns sin in the flesh. And it was in His flesh that He took these things that were contrary to our approach to God and that shut all us Gentiles out by that middle wall of petition we couldn't enter in. Christ nailed it to the cross. As they nailed Him to the cross, he made the way to God for Peter and for Titus. By the way, if you read the book of Galatians, and you should because it has to do with this particular chapter, you will find out that this thing was so successful, if I can call God being successful. But anyhow, this meeting was so prosperous in the things of the Spirit, it, the Bible says, Titus, whom they did not require to be circumcised. It was amazing that Paul, an apostle, Barnabas, a Levite, and Titus, an uncircumcised Gentile, go up to Jerusalem for this council. Boy, there's three, isn't it? And, and, and the thing was so powerful that they didn't require Titus to be circumcised. And it was a glorious thing, dear soul. And God was just as pleased with Titus being there as he was with Paul. Amen. Or James. Or anybody else. Listen. Then all the multitude kept silence. You know what that means? It means that Peter, by the Holy Spirit, uh, was used of God to shut their mouths and stop all their arguments. And guess what Paul does when you keep silence in a meeting? He pops up. Here he comes again. Then all the multitude kept silence and gave all audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. What were they doing prior to the meeting? Verse number four. They were received of the church and the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. What did they do when everybody kept silence for a few minutes in verse number 12? Declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. You better not give Paul an inch. He'll take a mile. <laughs> they said he'll preach at the drop of a hat. Sometimes he drops his own hat. And here he comes again. And so he, he proves Peter's point. This is show and tell. Peter is tell and Paul and Barnabas are showing what God did. It backs up everything Peter had said. He said, we went into city after city that had synagogues. And we went into one city that had no synagogue and they were pagans. And the result was the same through all of them. With the presence of the law in the city or without the presence of the law in the city, grace held up. Folks, you don't need to prop up the gospel. Just preach the gospel. Amen. You, don't need, you, you, don't, you don't need a prerequisite. You know, uh, you, listen, I, I used to be among the independent, fundamental, Bible-believing, premillennial, dispensational, bless God, hallelujah, Baptists. And you had to have your hair cut right. You couldn't wear a colored shirt. You had to wear a white shirt. And, and you, had to, you, you had to speak like we spoke and do what we do. And they didn't smoke and they didn't chew and they didn't go with the ones that do. Bless God, we're going to heaven. Men alive. 
God delivered me from that and delivered that out of me and brought me to Christ more fully and completely. I thought I saved for seven years because of what I was doing. Right. Right. Gospel hit me right square between, in the, in between the eyes of my heart and said, you ain't do nothing. Your righteousnesses are filthy rags before God. That kind of got to me. I had really been striving, striving hard. I was president of my Sunday school class, whatever that does for you. And, you know, I sung in the youth choir, bless God. You know, and I came to Wednesday night prayer meeting. Right. Oh, okay. Did all that stuff. But God says it's not what you did or are doing, it's what Jesus has done. Man, every bit of my religion fell off me and I stood naked before God. Yeah. All that old Baptist armor fell to the ground and great was the fall thereof. And I cried out to the Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. And God saved me. I mean, God saved me. I'd been saved by the Baptists. That didn't last. Now, this time God saved me, but the Baptists didn't like it when I told them I need to be baptized. They said, you already have been. See, it's right here on the pages of our books. We got it here in the minutes where you was back. Folks, I went down a dry center and come up a wet center. That's all y'all did to me. They didn't like it because I told them it didn't take. But what can I say? If you're sitting here today, a baptized sinner, a church member, you don't have Christ, you need to come to God. Yes. The hour's getting late, folks. Listen, how many more opportunities do you think you're going to have? You need to identify with Christ. You say, well, if I'm saved, I'm saved. Yeah, but if you're saved, you want to obey God. And God said, be baptized. Confess it with your mouth. Tell the church. That's what you need to do. If, if you, you think God's going to own you in heaven and you won't even own him right now, mm, you're in a heap of trouble. If you don't confess me before men, he said, I will not confess you before God and the whole, my Father and the holy angels. That's what God said. I don't know how I got into all that. Listen. And the multitude kept silence. Now listen at verse 13. And after they had held their peace... After Barnabas and Paul had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simon, that is Peter, hath declared how God at the first, he repeats it, a long while ago. You remember that in verse 7, first thing out of Peter's mouth, a good while ago. James repeats it. He said, God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. He did not try to make them Jews. He called out of them a people for his name. Now, he's fixing to quote Amos 9 verses 11 and 12, which are amazing. And he says, and because if I read Amos 9, 11, and 12, and if, if you want to, we can turn over there and read it and ask you well, what you think it means. Well, I've got here an elder of the Church of Jerusalem in the, in the first century is telling us what the Holy Spirit has shown him it means, so I'm taking the Holy Spirit's word for it out of the mouth of James. I can read Amos 9, 11, and 12, and, and I can see that about uh, closing up the breaches of David's tabernacle, and I can read, uh, he shall possess the, the remnant of Edom uh, and, and of all the heathen, uh, which are called by my name. And, and I won't get what James said out of this, but listen to this. Folks, you are so blessed. You've, you've got something laying in your lap 2,000 years ago. This thing happened historically. It's preserved for you. God was in it. And here is a man of God standing up and it takes James to seal the deal. First of all, you got the Apostle Peter. People say, well, Peter's always hopping on the same string. Every time we turn around, he's telling about Cornelius. We're tired of hearing it. And then Paul and Barnabas pop up and they say, well, you know, they're just excited about being excited. They're just telling us all about their travels. Okay, now the pastor stands up. He's got to live with you day after day and week after week. 
He's got to stand between you and God every single service. You know his uh, reputation. You know his spirit. You know how, what kind of man he is. And he's going to stand up and say, everything they said is true. And I want to prove it, not by their testimony only, but by the Old Testament law. Wow. Double wow. If there can be anything, quadruple wow. That's amazing. And here you have this in your lap. Listen, verse 15 of chapter 15. And to this agree the words of the prophet, prophets, as it is written. And he's, like I say, quoting Amos 9, 11, and 12. After this, I will return. Oh, that's the second coming of the Lord. Well, yeah. And he comes back a third and a fourth and a fifth and a hundredth and two hundredth and a thousandth. He just keeps on coming. He came to me when I was young. Bless God, I believe he's coming to me right now. Listen, after this, after the Old Testament is finished and sealed up, I will return and build again the tabernacle of David. The word became flesh and tabernacled among us. John 1 14. He isn't just talking about Jesus' his human body. He's talking about the spiritual body of Christ, the church. After the law and all that is fulfilled, I personally, God, will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down. And I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up. This is Christ being our resurrection, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord. After this, verse number 16, after the old economy is done, he hath fulfilled the first and replaced it with the second, and there ain't going to be no third. The church is going to go right on into glory. Listen, that after this, after the old economy is fulfilled, the law has been completed. And Jesus told John, he said, Let's, no, I want you to baptize me before it behooves us to fulfill all righteousness. we got to fulfill all the law. So once it was done, he returns by the Holy Spirit and begins to build up the broken down, ruined tabernacle of David that was a uh, physical and literal under the law. And he brings all of those who believed on the Messiah to come in that dispensation and all those who believe that Messiah has come in this dispensation and brings them all together, tears down the middle wall of petition and makes of twain one church. One new man. You know what twain is? Just ask Mark. Mark twain. Oh, come on. Listen. That the residue of men, all the Gentiles, might seek after the Lord. And the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. I want you to see that in these two verses, verses 16 and 17, James is saying to you, Christianity is necessary to fulfill Judaism. Lord willing, we'll get into this more. Seems like I'm giving you an overview of all of, all of this this morning. These two verses, James is saying, in the presence of these Judaizers, in the presence of Peter, in the presence of Barnabas and Paul, and Paul will get in your face if you ain't right, and Paul didn't get in his face, so this is right. In verses 16 and 17, James is saying to this church, he is saying that it, it requires Christianity to complete and fulfill Judaism. Now he's going to switch it around. And in verse number 18, he's going to, he says, known 
unto God are all the works, all his works from the beginning of the world. The inner linear says from eternity. Now, we grab that verse out and quote it separately. This is the first time I am preaching this verse in its context. Thank you, Lord Jesus. God showed it to me in Tyrone, Georgia on Friday afternoon. First time I ever saw this. If he is saying in verses 16 and 17 that Christianity fulfills Judaism, then what he's saying in verse number 18 is that God knew about this all along and that Judaism was prepared for the way of Christianity. You want me to say it again? Verse 16 and 17, Christianity fulfills Judaism. That, after this, I mean, the, once that was over with, the law was over, the last sacrifice, God split the veil, no more. Now you've got to come in with something that is going to fulfill it. Why? Because the law has but a shadow of things to come and not the very image of those things. The law has a shadowy substance. You want to see Christ in the Old Testament? You see a deer running in the yard through the lattice work. And you catch, catch glimpses of him in those diamonds that the lattice work makes. And that's, you see my beloved, like that stag out there. You see him in, in shadowy types. But what did the Lord Jesus say? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. Glory to God. It takes Christianity to fulfill Judaism. That's what this man was preaching. And then in verse 18, and he said, you know what? It didn't slip up on God. He knew about it when he called Abraham. Amen. When he called Moses. Yeah. Oh, all of this. The old economy. God knew about it. So he's saying, uh, listen, in, in the 18th verse, Judaism is that which was used of God to prepare the way for Christianity. The law is our blank to bring us to blank. Fill in the blanks. All right, here we go. The law is our schoolmaster, schoolmaster to bring us to... I'll rest my case. <laughs> Judaism prepared them for Messiah. Christianity, God in you, is what? The hope of glory. Okay, you say, I'm justified. How'd you get that? By faith. I'm sanctified. How do you get that? By the washing of the water by the word. And by obedience to the word. And I shall be glorified. How do you know that? Because Christ is in me. Yeah. If you I hadn't already had the first resurrection. Oh no, here he goes again. <laughs> if you hadn't already had the first resurrection, you ain't got no hope of the last resurrection. The second resurrection. That's right. The second resurrection. What is the first resurrection? Would somebody please tell them? Being born again, right? Yeah. What's the condition of the sinner? Ephesians 2, 1. Yeah. Dead in what? Yeah. What does a dead man need? Yeah. Went over to Pope Dixon's funeral home. They had a light at the end of the casket. Light bulb burned out. And they said, well, let's put a big one in there. Put a big one in there. That man didn't even blink. He just laid there dead as he was before they put a new light bulb in. He don't need light. He needs life. Amen. He needs life. And their soul, the law, was a schoolmaster. The Bible said we were kept. We were, we were kept. We were, we were like put in prison. We were kept in a holding pattern. We were put in a holding pen till Christ could come. And then, whoosh, everything in the Old Testament became real. Now you understand the Lamb in the Old Testament because you see Christ. Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Glory to God. 
James is preaching way beyond the scope of understanding in the religious realm today. Schofield has more authority in the American church than James will ever have except God Almighty bring back the power of the Holy Ghost and the effectual voice of the Word of God. And I'm praying for it. Yeah. I got my sails up. If the wind blows, honey, I'm gone. And you know what he said to do? Preach the Word. Be instant. Yes. In season or out of season. Well, if I had a hat, I'd drop it. Right? Yes, sir. That's what he said do. That's what we need to be about over here. Yeah. No, don't let the Philistines and, and the Canaanites draw you into what they're doing at their church. Amen. Just because it gives you a warm, fuzzy feeling. You say we got to do one thing. Preach the word. Support that preaching by prayer, by faith, by believing. By doing whatever is necessary to, 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 to ask God to make sure that we have the Word of God maintained among us. Listen, I saw a, a, a commercial yesterday. It said, if you buy one of these little scrubbing pads from Mr. Clean, it'll get your stove clean. And it's amazing to me how easy they can clean their stove. <laughs> and I done used four Brillo pads and I ain't even started on it yet. I'm going to tell you something. That new pad they got... I tried them, it don't work but about once, and then you gotta throw it away. And them things cost four hundred dollars a box. <laughs> but listen, listen. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Any sinners around here anywhere? And sinners plunge beneath that flood. Isn't that good? Yeah. The washing of water by the word of God. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. You're getting your souls washed here today if you're in the same spirit and you're believing God. And you, you, you are acquiring this as a hungry man acquires food. If you're chewing it up and swallowing it down and trusting God to sustain you by His Word. Dear soul, God is cleansing you and purifying you. And by the way, you don't even have to do that. Just, just believe God. Abraham believed God and what was the rest of that? Isn't that good? Isn't that good? How much more simple could he have made it? How much more simple could he have made it? Those that believe are not condemned, John chapter 3, but those that believe not are condemned already. Now, verse 19. Man alive. I don't give you an introduction so long as it took up all the time. Wherefore, my sentence is that is very important in Acts no it's not it's in Hebrews chapter 13 along about verse 17 I think it is you can look it up obey them that have the what over thee and no man can rule over your soul but Christ so if a man is shelling the corn if he's preaching the Word of God by the Holy Ghost, then it's that Word by the Spirit that's ruling over you. I can't tell you what to do. I don't know what to do for myself sometimes. But that Word rules you. This is Christ still ruling from His throne. That's what He's talking about. You shall reign and rule on the earth. It's gospel preaching that fulfills that. And, and listen, and... and, and he said, this is my sentence. My sentence is, when a man is in the Holy Ghost, he can claim God's authority for himself. Be assured I know this, and I want you to know that I know this, and I want you to know this. 
that God never gave his authority to any minister. He only gives his authority through right. his ministers. Right. And even Paul will tell you, don't follow me, but only as I follow Christ. First right. Corinthians 11. This man is going to stand here and look at these, you know, frowning, uh, legalistic, mean old uh, uh, Judaizers. He's going to stand there in the face of Peter. He's going to sum up Peter's message. And a lot of preachers don't like it when you get up and sum up their message. It's best you don't say nothing about what they preach ahead of you. They, might, they don't like it. Didn't bother Peter because he's in the same spirit. And he was standing there in the face of the Apostle Paul. One of the ones that's going to continue on through the rest of this book. Peter's name is going to drop off the pages of this book. Uh, so it, uh, Titus's name never gets on it. Barnabas', Barnabas name never, never gets on it. And there's so one of the most interesting things that I've ever found in my Bible uh, is, is how that the Apostle Paul shakes hands with the Apostle John for the one and only time right here. You won't see John anymore till you see him on the Isle of Patmos. Let me read it to you. I'll tell you the verse later because I don't want you looking down and trying to find it. Listen to me. And when James and Cephas or Peter and John, by the way, that's the same order their books appear in the New Testament. Titus, Hebrews, James, Peter, John. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, and that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. The Apostle Paul shook hands with the Apostle John, who was going on now to see Jesus on the Isle of Patmos. This is an amazing thing. Don't miss this. There's goody in this. And so here he stands at a moment, momentous a time at an unbelievable event. You've got Silas, Judas, Paul, Barnabas, Titus, Peter, John, the elder James, and all of these fellows gathered together in this one place. And the only time I can ever find... Now, some of you Bible scholars, you want to in, educate me, I would love it. But I can't find anywhere in the Bible that Paul and the Apostle John ever met or shook hands, except right here. By the way, that passage that I just read is in Galatians 2.9. I told you you need to read the book of Galatians if you're going to see this. So here stands up James, the pastor of the church in Jerusalem. And he has the audacity to say, quote, my sentence is. Dear soul, I got the audacity to tell you that what I'm telling you is from the Lord. If a man don't believe he's preaching what God's giving me, he ought not be in the pulpit. Amen. 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 And we got about 99% of men in the pulpit in fundamental religion in America that ain't there because God called them. And if it wasn't for Dr. Bottle Stopper's 25 outlines, they wouldn't have nothing to preach. Amen. Come on now. Listen. Listen. Let's finish this out. He said, <clears throat> Wherefore, Acts 15, 19, my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles not like this how do you say a, a Gentile got saved James are turned to God Paul uses that in 1 Thessalonians you have turned to God from idols or from idols to serve the true and living God that's what James said the Gentiles which have turned to God <clears throat> now he, in verse 20 he says, But that we write upon them that they abstain from pollution of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. 
Now, uh, we see then that what he's doing is being used of the Holy Ghost to break down the middle wall of partition between the Jewish believers and the Gentile believers. This is not something that is added to grace. If you add anything to grace, it becomes a disgrace. What he's saying is, we can, look at Romans 14, 19. We can have some peace and unity between us, even these Judaizers. We, we, can, we can have a, a middle ground where Jew and Gentile can come together. Just if the Gentiles will do these few things for us, it will help us to accept you. What was it that uh, separated the Jewish nation from all the world? The dietary laws. They couldn't sit down and eat with nobody. And it made them look like they thought they was better than everybody else. And they did come to think that they were better than everybody else. Because their bodies were pure and clean. They didn't realize that they were was full of excess and dead men's bones as Jesus said they, they were depraved and, and, and wretched sinners so in that verse 20 James in all of his wisdom is just saying you know what we can break down that middle wall of petition between Jew and Gentiles with just these few things and, and listen Gentiles if y'all would do this it make you, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it would purify you more than what you can think. Not only by what you've not eaten. Bentley Thomas stood in this pulpit right here and said, Boy, I used to love blood pudding before I got saved. <laughs> said, Mama, put blood in it. Said, It was rich and good. Said, When I got saved, God said, You ain't supposed to be eating blood. He said, I sure do miss it. He said, I stopped eating it right there. And, 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 and what he saying was, if, if the church is going to be made one, not a part Jew and a part Gentile, just show some, uh, what's that word when, when people compromise? Just compromise a little bit on these things and it will show the Jews that you're really sincere about this and we won't look at you as some wretched heathen. But it will show you that you can have compassion on the Jewish people. And, 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 and in that compassion, it will bring us together. Listen to Romans 14, 19. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace. And things wherewith one may edify another. What is the first sentence in verse 20? I rest my case. Right. Romans 14, 19, and 20 is the best commentary on Acts chapter 15 and verse number 20. It's just saying, you know what? We can avoid all this mess. I am here in the very heart of legalistic Christianity. I read it to you. In fact, you read it to me. Acts 21, 20. You read that last phrase. They have a great zeal for the law, though thousands of them have been saved. And here I am in the middle of it, and listen, y'all help me out here. Just do these few things, and it will show the true born-again Jews that there is a compatibility and a oneness between us, and we can come together on this. It's called compromise, and that is Bible, Acts chapter 14, verses 19 and 20. And he says in verse 21, you know what? For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. He's saying, and this can be done because the law of Moses is always read in all the cities in every synagogue. And guess who was attending the synagogues? That's where Paul ran into most of his Gentiles. We've already went, gone through that. Oh, oh, back over in chapter whatever. Uh, where was it in uh, Lystra? <clears throat> uh, in Iconium. I'll have to find it. But anyhow, uh, here it is in verse number 42 of chapter 13. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, may I add their synagogue, 
The Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. So the synagogues were full of Gentiles as well as Jews. But they were all having to separate at lunchtime and go their separate ways. They couldn't sit down and eat one another. He said, that ain't the way it ought to be. If we could just have these few little concessions. Is that a good word? Just compromise like this. It make your life more pure, Gentile, Gentiles. And, and Jews, it would make your life less legal and, and give a validity to the testimony of the Gentiles and give a compassion to the Gentiles for the Jews. And Paul said to him, he said, listen, if you Gentiles have received their spiritual things, what is it if you, if they receive your physical things? That's how he got them to give money to go up to Jerusalem and help the poor saints there. This is the same kind of thing. This is the same spirit. So here there is a coming to know the oneness of faith. And Paul goes on to say, and I know I'm running over. I don't even have to look at my watch. Uh, Paul goes on to say, for in Christ, <clears throat> you give me the second thing every time I give you the first thing. Are you ready? For in Christ there is neither Jew, there's neither bond, there's neither male, and there's something else, and I forgot what it was. But we are all one in Christ.